Greetings and salutations, my beautiful people, and welcome back to Canis Retrospectives, which was recently voted to being um, the most tragically annoying web show title card of 2013. We did good. And now we've reached the second instalment of Oddworld, Abe's Exodus. And do you know what? It just turns out that this is a cracker of a game. What? What are you looking at? What's the fight? Do I, have, do, I have something, do I have something on my face? I know. Oh. That's not right, is it? Okay, before anyone starts getting arsy or shitty and nitpicky about me, yes, I know this isn't technically the second major Oddworld installment. And to all of you who have no idea what I'm talking about and just had your childhood torn in half, let me explain. According to this little slip in the box for Munch's Odyssey, the Oddworld series was really aiming to be a quintology, meaning that five main installments would be made, with every other project being a sideline to the main thread of the Oddworld chronology and universe. The five main games, as far as I can fathom after the Just Add Water interview, are all intended as Odyssey titles, meaning that technically, Abe's Exodus is simply a bonus game to the saga, much like Stranger's Wrath and even the two bloody silly Game Boy games, which I actually really ended up liking for a little bit, so don't make fun of me or I'm gonna tell your mummy. And this also means that Munch's Odyssey is the proper second instalment followed by the upcoming Squeak's Odyssey, meaning that every Odyssey game covers a new, bizarre and twistingly cute character introduced into the lore of Oddworld. But who gives the monkeys? What is this, the, the Discovery Channel? We've covered enough chronological stuff to last us a good few tea times. So, the question is, why am I breaking the rules a little bit here with my usual retrospective formula for this one time? Well, one, Squeak isn't out yet. Two, Abe's Exodus follows directly after Abe's Odyssey, and Munch's Odyssey follows directly after Abe's Exodus, so it only makes bloody sense. Three, Abe's Exodus is huge. It's such a big game, and it's much bigger than Abe's Odyssey, and it just deserves to be its own standalone, not bonus entry to Oddworld. It, it just does, it's just too big to completely pass over and brush off as a bonus game. It's one of my favorite games of all time, not just PS1, but ever made. And four, because bugger you, that's why. So anyway, Abe's Odyssey, along with being an easy PlayStation 1 classic and a gorgeous bit of crumpet, was also very well critically acclaimed and praised for everything I mentioned thusly. I mean, look at how many people agreed with me. Oh. Oh. Well, <laughs> apparently it didn't make sense. Abe's Odyssey. Didn't make sense. Fun fact. Did you know that after the release of Abe's Odyssey, the Japanese market forced Oddworld to change the amount of fingers on the Modokan hands? The original four fingers on Abe were seen by the Japanese as relatable to a lower subclass of meat packers in Japan who often had work-related accidents, and it was seen as a highly disrespectful symbol that offended them due to their very low-class working and social conditions. After threats of large fines and legal battles, that's why in Abe's Exodus and the Japanese versions of both games, the Backstories and all subsequent cutscenes were changed to feature three fingers on all Madokan hands. Interesting. But apart from that, this game then went on to winning over 24 awards, such as the E3 Showstopper Award in 1997 by GamePro, and it even won the Best Director Award at the World Animation Festival in the same year. It retailed successfully as well, with 1.24 million copies sold to this day. But I think that most can agree, especially due to the sales figures, die-hard fanbase most games dream to have, and the subject matter, it then gained a huge cult following. So huge and so devoted that Oddworld Inhabitants had a task from GT Interactive, in which they gave them about nine months to start and finish an entirely new Oddworld game ready for Christmas the following year. And could Oddworld make another entire game in only nine months, let alone make it another gorgeous bit of crumpet and succeed the expectations of everyone? You bet your fucking ass they did! And on November 1998, Jesus Christ, they turned out even more creativity, thought-provoking ideas, humor beauty, weirdness, wildlife, character, tight story and script writing, better cutscenes, and somehow crafted a masterpiece in quicker time than some people can blow their own nose. And how exactly did Oddworld Inhabitants get this entirely new incredible game completely finished in only nine blooming months? Fruit. That's not even a joke. Sherry McKenna banned all donuts, burgers, and sweets from the offices of Oddworld and hung fruit baskets everywhere to make people work healthier and faster. And boy, did it work. So there you go, kids. Eat fruit, tie your shoes, don't poo yourself, and craft yourself a gaming masterpiece. If you couldn't tell already, I really do love this game. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the best 2D puzzle action platformer ever made. And it far surpasses everything that the first game set out to do and did it to the point of perfection. But I suppose I have to give you all a brief idea as to what this game actually did do to dramatically increase the scale and depth of the first one. Well, firstly, let's begin with...
And as far as I'm concerned, it's the best 2D puzzle action platformer ever made. And it far surpasses everything that the first game set out to do, and did it to the point of perfection. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the best 2D puzzle action platformer ever made. As far as I'm concerned, it's the best 2D puzzle action platformer ever made. And it far surpasses everything that the first game set out to do, and did it to the point of the first game. No. No. Jordan, what the fuck do you want? You dare say it again. What? You know, you bastard. Oh, that I think that Abe's Exodus is better than Abe's Odyssey. Uh, uh, Caddy, how could you even think that, let alone say it? Abe's Odyssey is the pinnacle of oddness. It is the epitome, the godly culmination of words that I can't even think of right now. You can't top the atmosphere in that game. The ancient rocks of Scrabania, the eerie trees of Paramonia, the great escape from Rupture Farms, the haunting world beyond the stockyards, complete with silver moons hanging in the skies. How many? One? Two? Three? I don't know how many moons. How many moons does Oddworld have? Who the fuck knows? And what about Abe? What about him? His shivering gutlessness, his fear, his fear which shifts into a sense of heroic dignity, like Courage the Cowardly Dog on a Saturday night. What is childhood? What is life? What is this? Stop! Why don't you make your own damn video about it? Fine. I will. But not because you asked me to. Okay. You know what? Just to save everyone the stress of finding that video, just click here to go straight to it. Because one, I think it'll be some pretty good shit. And two, I think it will shut Jordan up. So anyway, the story this time around followed directly after the events of the last game. Well, I mean, that depends if you saved enough Mudokans, and if you didn't, well, you get the bad ending, and I'm not gonna spoil any more than that. You wanna see it? Well then, you should dish out some cash and go buy this stinking game. And if Abe did save enough Mudokans, his celebration is carried on from the last game before being cut short after a nasty fall and a visit from the three weirdos. That's what they're actually called. And they inform Abe that the Gluckens, after losing everything from the Rupture Farms meat processing, figured out, somehow, that ground Grounded Mudokan Bones could make a fantastically tasty beverage called Soulstorm Brew. Oh, like the original title from the last game! And the bones were being exhumed from an ancient Mudokan burial ground called Necrum. But here's the tragic part, the Glucken still needed Mudokan slaves to do this. So how do they get around to them not ever knowing what they were digging up? Well, they stitched their fucking eyes shut. Stitched their eyes shut. This was the scariest image ever for me as a kid. It's real nightmare fuel. What was the age rating on this game again? Oh, 11 plus, okay. So after your still beating heart is ripped out of your tiny little chest, Abe then figures out that the weirdos were disturbed spirits from the bone mines of Necrum pleading for his help. And so an epic voyage of dark discoveries, tragic happenings, sadness, oddness, and hilarity ensues so that Abe can shut down the bone works, the brewery, save all the Mudokan slaves, restore peace to the natives, and let the ghostly Mudokans finally rest in peace. Yeah, it does seem like a very similar story to Abe's Odyssey, with similar locations to explore, similar game structure, similar action, and similar puzzles. And do you know what? It's all very true to a certain extent. The basic present time ideas on consumerism and the game style, yeah, it's all pretty similar. But honestly, where everything else comes to fruition is with I'm not even joking, it may sound like I'm building this up to be basically an improved replica of Abe's Odyssey, but seriously, this game, this game is just, just, just how a sequel should be, if you ask me. And it's not even in the same ballpark as Abe's Odyssey. As you will soon understand. This game enhanced absolutely everything the first one had, ironed out every floor it faced, included so much more content, added so many different enemy types and variants, and so many more obstacles, items, cutscenes, mudokans, wildlife, abilities, vehicles, and- Oh my god, this is amazing. Before I list anything else that this game had, it's vital that I mention the best thing they could have ever done with this series was done here. Quick saving. Yes, 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 and yes. Quick save anywhere, at any point, very fast, to quickly restart anywhere you wanted for quick and simple, fast-paced puzzle experimenting. And that's all I need to say, make your own checkpoints anywhere you go. This really needed to happen, and thank fuck it did. Mostly due to how much more grand and spectacular the puzzles were with all the different enemy and wildlife types now present, and any frustration was completely put to bed. Also, as a kid, I remember this game being like an urban legend. I'd be playing Ridge Racer Revolution or some shit, and then my friend would come up to me and be like, Hey James, you really need to play Abe's Exodus. And I'd say, Oh yeah, why is that? Isn't it the same thing as the first game? And he'd say, No, because you can drive a minecart that blows every fucking thing up you drive into. And I'd say, No way, Abe can't drive. And he'd be like, 
like. Yeah, he can, and he can also possess his own flying farts that go. And then explode. And then I'd say, I need this game now. But anyway, I'll go into more detail about all that stuff later. Let's begin with the presentation, and it uh, it speaks for itself. What can I possibly say that I didn't already say in my last video? If anything, there was just a lot more stuff going on, and much broader and more ambitious landscapes that had a ton of depth trailing back as far as the eye could see. And of course, I can't forget the musical score composed by Ellen Mayers, and Jesus Christ, it's so much better than the last one. It's more musically complex, there are more instruments, more little melodies, and it's just such a a great successor to the first one. Let's not forget the cutscenes, which had over 20 minutes worth of more animations, explosions, intricate detail, witty dialogue, and tons more voice acting. And beating the stages you passed through was solely worth it just for the glory and majesty of some of the best cutscenes of all time. Their sense of humour and technical prowess was improved by a thousandfold with this game. And, little trivia here, this game has my most favourite opening to any game ever. Fun fact. Did you know that after the release of this game, Oddworld Inhabitants condensed some of the cutscenes and made a few more specifically to fit into a 15 minute movie, which was then nominated for an Academy Award? Unfortunately, it didn't win, but it's still finger licking. <laughs> Good. But here's the thing, bouncing off of what Jordan said earlier, where I do see where he's coming from, and slightly agree with him actually, the atmosphere of this game was pushed in a way that a sequel to Abe's Odyssey should have pushed it. Yes, the Paramonian and Scrabanian temples, Stockyard Escape, and even Rupture Farms in the first game were all gorgeous and beautifully deranged, and they were all heavily oriented and thick in pure, natural, hostile, and wildly diverse atmosphere to create a living and breathing world. But where I do slightly prefer this aura, I loved how Exodus diverted away from this enveloping and shrouded atmosphere and went for a very mechanical and horrifically oppressive atmosphere that instead didn't let you sit there with your mouth gaping open in amazement. Which for this game was really good as it further solidified the fact that Oddworld was changing. It was evolving for the worst and the scale of everything from the slave and enemy numbers to the sheer number of different industrialised areas truly planted that fact even further in to add a sense of tension that I had never before seen in a game. Abe was definitely on his biggest and most dangerous quest yet and the environment and atmosphere spoke that fact to you the second you begin. So yeah, Jordan, I like this. Fun fact. Did you know that due to another Japanese controversy which has been undisclosed, the original Mudokan meat posters, known as Mudokan Pops, had to be altered to a more ambiguously happy image. Hence the change in Exodus and in both Japanese installments. Yeah, it looks happy. As you can see from what you've been seeing in this video, if you compare the two games from screenshots or just general gameplay, it does look like the same idea as Abe's Odyssey. The 3D rendered models, the gorgeously detailed and distortedly depraved environments, the familiar control scheme, game speak and possession, saving buddies through bird portals and everything makes a return. But like I've been saying through every second of this video, it was all amplified so much that it felt like an entirely different game. The control was tweaked and sped up ever so slightly for a quicker paced and more aerodynamic experience, making the platforming puzzles and is a little less stressful. Not to mention there were a lot more skill based sections to test your reactions as well as the fantastic puzzling, so you know what? No complaints there. The number of Mudokans were increased to 300 against the previous 99, putting a lot of weight on poor Abe's shoulders, but also meaning there could be more puzzles that were even more greatly designed with the new obstacles and environmental hazards. Speaking of hazards, there were also tons more enemies to pick Abe off. The original monsters from the wild made a glorious return, as well as the trigger happy lackeys known as Sligs. But then this also gave way to parasitic fleeches that followed and chewed on Abe before eating him robot greeters with motion sensors to zap Abe to ash, and even the Gluckens themselves made their presence as an actual in-game threat as opposed to simply being the evil overlords. But saying that, you could also defend yourself even better with the new minecart vehicles, meaning invincible death carts of doom. And it gave off a lot of explosions. It's simply the death! Not to mention we find out what happens when slogs have babies, what slicks look like with no pants or guns, and grenade launching helicopter slicks were there to show the true diversity of the creatures of Oddworld and their origins, as well as provide insane challenge and keep you on your toes even further. Talking about diversity again, we then, of course, feature the game speak. Firstly, you could talk to everyone at once. Quick saving and talking to everyone simultaneously would have made this game perfect from the get-go, but you know, Oddworld are prone to doing even more than that and blowing up my bollocks sometimes. But yeah, more game speak commands were added, allowing other Mudokans to work for even more tricky puzzles unexplored before and of course they all listen to you. But along with that, even more social interactions were possible with slapping and even apologising. But why on earth would you need to do that? Because the Mudokans, much like the wildlife, all had distinctive personalities. But these were more than just traits this time. They were emotions. Depending on what happened to them or what you did to them, they could be normal, hyperactive, angry, depressed, sick, blind, and they all added even more puzzling elements not only to save them, but protect yourself in the process and work around their feelings to get the puzzle solved. Whether it meant comforting them, slapping them, ignoring 
ignoring them or telling them to stop before grinding themselves up. And not only could you game speak with your own kind, but oh my god, you could game speak everything! And why was that? Because you could possess everything! Possession came back at full force. First, before I say any more, allow me to <coughs> quote myself, but in this one, you can possess nearly fucking anything. Even your own exploding flying farts! Yep, that's right. Weren't those scrabs annoying in the first game? How about those paramites? They were a bit tricky, weren't they? So how would you like to possess them? Hmm? No? Okay, then, well, how about the Gluckens themselves? And what if, what if, you could properly talk to each other with another library of commands to kill even more things and solve even more complex puzzles and look fucking ridiculous walking around as a fucking Glucken and what? Whoa, whoa, did you see him jump there? He's like a sausage. I mean, shit, this is too much awesome. This is how you do a sequel, everybody. No, no, I have no complaints about this game. None. None whatsoever. No, 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 And when all things are considered, this game spanned over two fucking discs. You got hours worth of original content, devious puzzles, slick gameplay, the best cutscenes ever, and pure raw gratification. So, does Oddworld Abe's Exodus hold up today? <laughs> what do you think? I love this game. That's it. I have no conclusion. <laughs> and I would say go, find it pre-owned, <laughs> not on Amazon though, pop this fucker in and spend six hours or so absorbing and loving every second of this gaming masterpiece. The best I've ever managed to win this game with is 291 out of 300 Mudokans. And I'd love to hear what you guys come up with if you decide to play this or revisit it. Everything was smooth sailing for Oddworld here. And after this, everything seemed to be relaxing out and gave nothing but good news for the inhabitants. But the question is, with the new generation of gaming approaching fast, could they go even further or dare I say top this game by another instalment. Hello everybody and thanks very much for watching part 2 of my Oddworld mini retrospective. If you enjoyed this video then please don't forget to hit that little like button and share this video around and if you like what you saw then please subscribe to my channel to see all sorts of all sorts of stuff. Part 3 will be linked onto this page as soon as I get it done but it's not done yet obviously but it will be when it's done so this message will be a little bit irrelevant I suppose but there you go. So if it's your birthday today or watching this video happy freaking birthday to you. Please remember to stay beautiful and much loves guys I'll see you all next time.